Hello. Well, today I'm going to talk about a movie. <clears throat> Shockingly, I've never actually spoken about before. Um, I made some videos of certain lists of like favorite movies and all, but um, <clears throat> never actually um, made a video dedicated to it itself, which is interesting, I think. Um, Considering how much I really love this film. Um, and that film is Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Um, to anybody who has never seen this film, it's about uh, uh, the, uh, a potential nuclear, <clears throat> nuclear annihilation of the world. A, an American general named Jack D. Ripper, played by a uh, Sterling Hayden um, gets it in his mind that uh, Russians are like invading, gonna are uh, like invading America and all this sort of thing, and how need to prepare for a potential evasion at the Air Force. <clears throat> um, and has a ordered a strike on uh, uh, um, you know on uh, uh, on Russia with all the planes flying near around <clears throat> you know uh, the Soviet Union um, and you know there's a uh, Royal Air Force Captain Lionel Mandrake, played by Peter Sellers, who is also playing three other, or two other characters. And uh, he's interacting with Ripper and is trying to get the uh, code to recall all the planes when it becomes very apparent that the, the general is just basically out of his mind and he just needs to try to get the code so that uh, I can get all the planes uh, away from uh, uh, bombing uh, specific targets that they are uh, supposed to uh, attack. Um, and then, uh, as it, uh, interestingly, on the back of this, it says, uh, Sellers also plays uh, the ineffectual and per per perpetually dumbfounded U.S. President Merkin Muffley who must deliver the very bad news of you know what's going on to the Soviet Premier um, and then also Peter Sellers plays the titular Dr. Strangelove a wheelchair-bound president advisor with a Nazi past finding an improbable hilarity to nearly every unimaginable scenario and he you know he has like a uh, the doctor has a hand that has a bite of his own because basically like a backstory they made up was um he had some sort of accident and so now it just does whatever and he wears a black glove um and to people who don't know this film was directed by stanley kubrick who obviously has made many other films is not a comedy because this is a black comedy <coughs> and it is my favorite comedy ever um it's just hilarious uh and the thing about this is that stanley kubrick was basing this film off of a book red alert alert uh by peter george who helped co-write the film with kubrick as well as terry southern who helped uh dennis hopper and <coughs> Uh, Peter Fonda right? Easy Rider so you know the three of those guys wrote this film and the, the book Red Alert is very serious and uh, you know there's like this uh, you know it's not a laughing matter and yet Kubrick when reading the book uh, you know and then he did research about the whole nuclear arms race and everything and 
how he himself even thought like I might be <laughs> blown up any moment. And then he, as he kept researching and reading more, he found the whole idea of that not only preposterous but just hilarious that people are seriously believing any moment we could all be nuked just like that and he just thought well that's just hilarious and this movie has to be a comedy and so <clears throat> and basically you know uh, that's how it really began um, obviously I have the criterion Uh, collection edition of this on Blu-ray. I also have the DVD over there. I don't have the 4K version yet, but I've seen it. Is it that expensive? So I might get it at some point in the near future. Um, and this film is 60 years old. It came out in 1964. Um, also, uh, Slim Pickens plays a, uh, a pilot. <laughs> Uh, and James Earl Jones is in this film. This is his first movie of his entire career. But yeah, Slim Pickens, he... Uh, that role was supposed to be Peter Sellers. He was supposed to play four parts. You know, two parts with the president and Dr. Strangelove because they're interacting with each other. <clears throat> supposed to... Uh, obviously, he's also Lionel Mandrake. I wish he said that. That that voice that he had was uh, he uh, uh, was basically uh, how he would sort of imitate the uh, officers whenever, like when he was in the military, Britain. He what to his fellow, uh, <clears throat> you know, the, the people he was with. He would often imitate them, and of a sort of. I guess snooty, uh, uh, sounding voice, and uh, I remember there was something where Kubrick actually asked him to Sellers how to play the part of the president, like, well, like, you know, like George Stevenson won the presidency, like that, basically act like that guy, <laughs> and then uh, Doctor Strangelove, uh, his voice came from a putting a German accent on this voice of a this uh, photographer named uh, named Ouija and it sort of talked like this and, uh, and so when you uh, and so when you put the German accent on it it doesn't sound so bad <laughs> and even is uh, very comedic <laughs> and um, there's also like they have there's also a doomsday device uh, featured in this that's talked about and how it could potentially just destroy the world and all that um, uh, James Earl Jones is on the plane and um, yeah George C. Scott's in this film also he plays a general also but Uh, journal, uh, General uh, Buck Turgidson uh, and there's uh, Slim Pickens was Major King Kong and uh, Keenan Wynn plays uh, Colonel Bat Guano uh, so yeah and a lot of these are puns and also for the most part are sexual indie windows or something sexual about it and uh, first thing you see in the film as the titles begin is a military plane is uh, getting you know refuel or fueled like uh, having more fuel into the plane but of course it looks like uh, sex <laughs> is happening so yeah so a lot of stuff like that is in this film um, with names and other such things but yeah this this is a great addition and has new interviews and uh, older stuff from like uh, the past DVDs and Blu-ray uh, version so this is <clears throat> so in a lot of ways this is probably like one of the best versions of the film 
Uh, of course, they don't have this on 4K, so if you wanted that, you're either going to have to buy the 4K version on its own, or maybe if, uh, you know, obviously they still have the criteria, seems to have the rights, because I see that this is still being, at least as of the last I saw, this was still being sold. Um, but, uh, yeah. 4K isn't all that expensive, so if you want that, you can probably get it. I don't know how all the special features, if there's all of this is imported there or not, but regardless, this is a very good addition. Um, and it was, you know, there's this thing like yeah, in this version where somebody's like how Stanley, like Peter Sellers, didn't really ad lib anything at all because basically everything that he says in the film. Um, was actually written in the script and <clears throat> one thing that I've, I've noticed and seen sometimes what happens is like if a director you know, when they're shooting a scene or something like you know if the director likes some stuff that was said uh, like for instance Jaws you know there's there has been as time went on debate like Roy Shatter never actually improvised you're going to need a bigger boat. Uh, that was written and everything. You can find it in, in the script and all that. And Jaws was a film where the script was not complete at all when they were shooting the film. So uh, some things that might be said on set or whatever would be incorporated into the script. And when Roy Scheider actually saw the actual shark, like when they weren't shooting, he made the comment, you're gonna need a bigger boat. I don't know if he, I don't think he was believing, I don't believe he was speaking to Spielberg, but he overheard that and he wanted him to say that in the movie. Like when he goes back <clears throat> into the cabin of the boat to, or quit is, say that to him. And so, because then I also, it wouldn't be surprising that it would then be written into the uh, script, so if they ever had to reshoot that again at some point at a later date, that line would be in the script, so that way he could just read it and then see it again. Um, with uh, Strange Love, it wouldn't surprise me if that's what happened to Kubrick, because Kubrick has actually said that he thought, you know, like Peter Sellers was the fourth writer of the film. Like, he contributed so much off-the-top things to say. Like, he would start off with what was written in the script, but at a certain point, and I've, I've read various things like that, you know, either after, like, the first line or two, he would just go off on his own, or maybe you'd say half of those liners or something, like, as the president. And then he just started to go and off in his own direction, like, oh... You know, a little funny in the head, you know, just a little funny, and uh, that kind of thing. He was, you know, he would just say stuff off the top of his head and keep things going, and there's a moment where he's Dr. Strangelove and his hand is doing his whatever. All that is Peter Sellers, because he's supposed to just deliver the lines, but he's making his hand, you know, Having a mind of its own, so it's doing stuff. So he's banging his hand, his arm, his right arm with his left hand, and it was the premier is of the Soviet Union's. You could see him is actually he's smiling and like chuckling, not to burst out laughing and ruining the take. Um, but you know, stuff like that happened often things he said and did that was never written, never given a direction to do this or that, and you know, Kubrick, like Peter Sellers was like one of only two people allowed to improvise on his films, like this is the second and last film Sellers ever did with uh, uh, Kubrick, he previously did Lolita with uh, Kubrick, which was two years prior um, but then he <clears throat> you know and they did Full Metal Jacket with Arlie Ermey and he allowed half of what Arlie Ermey said just to be 
whatever he wanted because he was in the Marines. He knew that lifestyle. He knew the kind of person that Gunnery Sergeant Hartman would be. And he basically was given essentially free reign at various points to say and do whatever would be completely appropriate in, in a scene or some situation. So, you know, Peter Sellers is one of the very lucky few to be able to say and do basically whatever and enhance the character that he's playing, in this case characters, and other stuff. And uh, also he improvised the line of string in my, in my leg. So, what? The string? I mean, you got me legs. Because he actually kind of forgot the line that he was supposed to say, so he just came out of a string instead of thing, so he just just kind of went with that, and uh, that's in the film, because <clears throat> it's, you know, string in my leg is funnier than this thing in my leg. It, it gave me legs, you know. That, that's funnier than just, what, what you know, the string is funnier than what he was supposed to originally say, but this film was nominated for four Academy Awards, Best Picture, Director, Adapted Screenplay and Best Actor. My opinion, it should have won all four. Um, but if for whatever reason it was only going to win one, Peter Sellers should have won for this. In my opinion, this is his best performance of his career. Um, I know many people do make the case for being there. That's an excellent film itself. Um, I've talked about that before. Um, but this film really shows how diverse and talented uh, Peter Sellers was. He was able to do multiple characters in a film, different voices, accents, and just being amazing. Um, it would have been cool if he played the Sim Slim Pickens part where he was, you know, playing a Texan and everything, uh, but he just felt like he was being overworked and he, apparently he faked an injury where he sprained his ankle. Preparing to, you know, he was on top of the bomb, like, because obviously there's that famous shot, which has been parodied so many times, uh, and, um, you know, he was, you know, on it, making sure he could, like, sit on it right and, uh, and everything, but then, you know, he apparently fell and injured his leg, but, you know, a biographer of Peter Sellers makes it seem to indicate that it, he actually was not injured, but he pretended he was, so that way he couldn't walk around in the small, confined uh, uh, airplane set, which was very, very small and cramped, just as it would be if you were on an actual military, you know, plane. Uh... And, uh, it's very, very, uh, and there is, a, you know, there is the back of the bomb that was written. Hi there. And there's also, you know, Dear John, referencing a Dear John letter. There, and, yeah. this back and I'll uh, show you what's all in this which is you know, top secret you know, you know strategic air command top secret plan R <laughs> um, which if you've seen the movie you'll know what that is and Criterion you know they always have stuff and it's pretty cool and funny and now they have like little booklets and stuff of that nature, but here what they've done is they do have a booklet, and there is a uh, booklet in here, but also there is one woman in the film, and so who is you know who is with uh, Buck Turgenson, George C. Scott's character, and uh, there it is. 
you ever seen a commie drink a glass of water? Yeah. Yeah, they drink vodka. That's all they drink. Uh, but yeah, this uh, has some stuff about uh, Terry Southern and other such things. And, and there's a picture that you see in the film, which is, uh, you know, supposed to be like a you know, Playboy magazine. Where is that? And, um, and that doesn't have a uh, cast and crew and all the stuff of like thanking people for the restoration and all that stuff. Yeah. And talking about that, so. Yeah, about the restoration. But, you know, and this uh, Holy Bible and Russian phrases. Which there is some Russian phrases, but no Bible quotes. But yeah, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but there's a. Yeah. Does anyone speak, or does anyone here speak English? Help! I don't understand. Where's the toilet? And they have uh, how you break down pronouncing those. Were, uh, words and sentences and there's the here is the cast and then the other credits and then the beginning of the about restoration and so there's that and then there is a essay about it and top secret so they have to have top secret R on it page one page two page three and page four so you know uh This film and this set is really good. I and I love watching this film every so often. And since this is the 60th anniversary, uh, I thought it was appropriate to rewatch this and to also talk about it. Since I actually realized I never s spoke about this beyond you know I like you know in terms of lists like. This, in my top 10 favorite films and my favorite comedy. So, yeah. That's my overall thoughts on <laughs> Doctor Strange Love. It's a hilarious film, great performances, great writing, direction, and everything. Made by uh, Stanley Kubrick, who is not so known for his sense of humor, but Apparently had a, a very good one. And I mean, if anything, this is one that proves he definitely has a sense of humor. So if you thought so many of his films were very serious and perhaps even uh, dire or dreary at certain points, like The Shining or The Clockwork Orange and whatnot, this is a film that is, you know, it's a black comedy, but it's definitely worth a watch at least once so yeah if you've seen dr strange love what do you think do you uh, enjoy this film do you dislike this film why or why not you can leave your comment in the uh, uh, in the below and just <clears throat> you know give your thoughts on it um and with that I hope all of you are doing well. Hope you're all ha you will all have a great day. Hope you all have a great weekend and a great week. And I'll see you all next time. Oh, I forgot to change this to August. There you go. It's Han Solo. There you go. Even more it makes sense. You go. 
James Earl Jones, who voiced Darth Vader in Star Wars calendar. Also, Dave, uh, David Prowse, who was Darth Vader in the suit in the original trilogy, was in A Clockwork Orange, so there you go. More Star Wars Kubrick connections. And then he made 2001 between this and A Clockwork Orange, which was science fiction, like you know, Star Wars. <clears throat> anyway, uh, kind of rambling now, but, you know, I guess in a way it kind of all ties together somehow, you know, war and Star Wars and whatever. Anyway, hope you're all uh, doing well. Uh, please take care, and uh, yeah.